Hello. Today I would like to work with you on voicing polyphonically in parallel tracks the expressive while clear breathing texture of music without a down and an up, a melody and an accompaniment rather is um, following several tracks at the same time as a listener and projecting them as a performer. Let's take the example of the slow movement of the pathetic sonata by Beethoven. There is a melodic line usually on the top, and here a secondary melodic line in the bass line, which is not only harmonic roots, but a second melody that mirrors in inversion almost the opening sequence of intervals of the melody descending second, ascending fourth, step motion and right up to the almost dominant to reach from A flat to E flat in the left hand ascending fourth descending second is an exchange of voices mirroring each other with inversions and then the passing tones the step motion here the leap in the melody of the right hand top is a seventh and in the left hand is an octave, a little more than the seventh. And if you follow the two, you can think, why don't invert? What is on top can be under. Zero gravity. And then in the middle... Basing of a hinted Alberti bass, just the all part, not the triad, but just two of three sounds, the third, without the fifth. But basing and tucked in the nest inside. Chromatically rising to the sixth degree, second, in a sequence of dropping fifths, but this time is a five of two, secondary dominant. What would we do without secondary dominance? We'll have to mutilate all the time, we'll be everywhere all the time and nowhere all the time. This way we always home, but we visit relatives rather than so it colorizes, it gives a character of quality of alteration. 
for a given tone and it creates melodically therefore a triton down diminished fourth up and triton down to the leading tone A flat that comes with a soothing expression of hugging cadence wellness so subtly in the melodic line you have these leaps of um, so-called dissonant um, intervals that are not major or minor or perfect but diminished or augmented what makes them so special in terms of tension for the release to come is that they overlap the expected resolution of their alteration and they go directly beyond like skipping a generation instead of elliptically the leading tone of the secondary dominant of none, five of two should go to B flat but he just goes to the third so avoids the full resolution on the tonic of the secondary dominant or the second degree and then drops to the leading tone creating from the third of the second degree which is in fact the subdominant fourth degree five with the seventh which is the leading tone in French language leading tone is not sensible the sensitive tone I don't think that leading means as much clearly the um, um, magnetic attachment of the leading tone to the tonic Tonic being awkwardly the weakest link of the tonality, except that it gives its name to the key. Other than that, it has relatively no strategic tone-centered power. It's almost like parliamentary democracy. You have to go secondary dominant. It's a whole um, act of using alterations in order to delay the obvious, which is the punctuation arrival, what I call the hugging cadence. For instance, um, if we were to conclude without these secondary dominant alterations, but remaining in the original key, and not modulating per se in terms of um, staying longer or equal time in the next tonality. My teacher had said, Mademoiselle Boulanger, one day to me that modulation is when you buy your ticket before you have started your trip. So you're really mentally projecting your desire or obligation sometimes of a trip you have to do, but you don't start it on the day your transportation starts. It's rather on the day you planned it and let's say purchased the ticket. So while you're still in your original place. So in a way this secondary dominance allow to daytime, daydream escape the reality and then but just for the glimpse of a moment and then you've never left flat major luminous second movement tonality of the piece. So if you were to do these opening bars and you would be a composer trying to avoid any alterations then you'll do major is beautiful by itself. It's like saying a foreign language I don't speak is dull or bad because I don't understand it. Again, meaning and beauty connected. Or disconnected as phonemes when you only hear it as sounds and not as meanings when you don't know the language but you hear it. And in the case of intelligent listening, you are driven to think about what is said through the sounds. 
and feel what it suggests in, let's say, subtle hints of tensions of two dropping triton couldn't be more dissonant interval since already the Gregorians called this the devil in music, the triton, the diminished fifth of the augmented fourth. Ah, I think that perhaps Beethoven, hopefully, but I say that with, of course, relative humor, <laughs> didn't think of all of these things. Oh, let me write a melody that will incorporate this and that and modulate but not and intervals with, the, uh, with secondary dominant leading tones that don't resolve to their secondary tonics in order to create a sense of expectation. And finally, a sense of meaning at the very end of the sentence. One can also discuss the fact that German uh, syntax, in terms of the language, of course, um, the way you organize the, the words, lexically, grammarly, the verb should most of the time in German language come at the end. So the action comes after the subject and the purpose and the evocation and the enumeration. So till the end of the sentence, the listener who listens to the narration or to the storytelling or to the conversation, in literature terms, is suspended on the expectation of knowing if this happened, happens, or will happen, for instance. And I think that that sense of longing is also at the heart of the um, Romantic era music in Europe. You expect, you delay, you perhaps indulge in that delayed expectation, but it also gives you the pace of the time in which they lived, which was a time without electricity, artificial light, so there were real cycles of dark and and clear. I would say even light, but with candles at night, was not exactly as today. There was a sense of, um, you, you felt the time passing in terms of seasons and cycles of days, um, because you depended on the elements rather than you Appearingly, appearingly today, dominate the elements. Oh, we don't dominate the elements. Uh, they always dominate us since we start dying at birth without choice. But make sense of it while on the rise, this ride on this tramway of life. And then we discover the beauties of the past. We love the persons of the present or we regret the people who we didn't or who left, and then we devote to our future generations, students, children, or our own descendants, a sense of belonging, therefore, to a, to a group, of course, not ethnically, and our music leads not the stylistically, because we play music of so many, it's like a mixed salad today. It's almost unthinkable to play just one author. Um, Whenever in the 19th, 18th, 17th centuries in Europe, classical, as we call it, music, was devoted only to the music of its time in its place on its time. So Scarlatti or Haydn or Handel or Bach or Chopin, they only dealt with the music of their own, their own music, but in their own time. Today we are more encyclopedia oriented, museum oriented, um, original instruments reproductions or original restorations, performance, informed knowledge about how we think, assume, study by scholars and teachers, music was taught, played, improvised, organized, orchestrated. Um, what were the th tools of th music theory? how tonal system came to become from modal back to afterwards into atonal. Sort of like um, we try to find the continuum in the history of music as if there is a 
purposeful meaning of evolution, even instrumental for us pianists, or the harpsichord, than the piano. That is a luxury that we have for living longer and having, uh, compared to past generations, so much more access to all these informations. But in their time, they only played the music of their time on their instruments. And uh, not that they were uninterested, obviously, by the past, but the past was not as precisely studied because of the luxury of time that they didn't have, I believe, and also, of course, availability of information. So perhaps in this context, broadly and perhaps roughly um, brushed, as I just did, in this uh, background of uh, 19th century in Germany, beginning of 19th century, opening the door to Romanticism, as Beethoven did. They were progressive because they're transgressing the form, but they're remaining within the tonal system, which even Chopin would use and Liszt would use, and they didn't feel like they needed to reject it until Schoenberg. But the fact is, is that we today plunge in a given time period and try to find what defines it in sound, in resonance, in pedal, in voicing, in following the experience of the travel, storytelling, story lingering or longing to its conclusion in a phrase that is further than just a group of four, four to two sentence. And just because it's so meaningful, and just because we're not in the century of quick um, and lack, therefore, of concentration on one subject, therefore quick browsing through subjects, we have to be saved. <laughs> students ask me, should I take the repeat? And I ask them, should you repeat what is written already? And in this case, it's not a repeat in the terms of notation. But there is a repeat of the musical element. In this case, the full sentence, quite long, of the opening statement. So is it because Beethoven thinks the listener is in to be repeated right away, right away, what he said, what he said, how it was, how it was. Not that Debussy is still doing it. He does this modular, I call it echo cell, repetitivity of the element. Uh, differently harmonized, but repetitive right away, almost like stuttering because motivically he develops cells that connect to each other, a bit like in a Lego, um, with redundancies. And in, in fact, imitative, I believe, but most people too, obviously, even if when it's said it sounds a bit artificial um, or overstated because it's a hinted exaggeration at that point, uh, is um, the imitation of the human brain's thinking process which we don't hear since we don't vocalize it, but sometimes we just patch thoughts that don't reach each um, rhetorical conclusion every time like we would do in a written speech to ourselves. Whenever in the post-Baroque era, in the early classical Haydn sonata form establishment, Viennese first school, where Beethoven, of course, belongs to even if he really doesn't like it, and will break a lot of those rules as he goes on in his compositional journey in terms of the uh, stylistic journey, unlike Bach and perhaps some other composers who are like uh, Mozart. From first to last piece, the same. Whenever some composers like Beethoven, Stravinsky evolved stylistically to the point to which they lost some of their followers when they moved to another style. But 
perhaps remained true to themselves while exploring and others didn't need to explore because the expression of their um, inner truth whether Schubert it was just Schubert oh okay you could say but it remember reminds Beethoven or Mozart stylistically in Vienna how can, can it not but that means to say that my grandmother has the same feature as your grandmother because she was an old woman well obviously everybody had similar features musically and they didn't search to be different just for the point of it or just for an intellectual um, endeavor of a stylistic um, indication of um, their own universe like you don't have to create your own alphabet your own language to be understood better as a matter of fact you would be mostly misunderstood so they all spoke the common language of all the tonal system in terms of musical language and um, they coded it in their personality and I find that each of these personalities are so strongly different that we almost forget in terms of the stylistic differences their um, tonal system unit of inspiration or rather of tools using the know-how it would be a interesting if Beethoven thought that um, tonal system is finished and he said of writing tonic dominant tonic second very dominant to the five of five in the dominant and then repeating it and up to the middle section Is it because he can have more ideas that he repeated? No, the repeat is part of the expression. Would it be because of the sign with the dots and the double line or just in the musical language itself? As if when you say something meaningful you repeat it not because the person to whom you say it is unable to understand you but because you want to insist that it's not just the lexical fact if you say I love you to a pet and the pet doesn't answer you say it because it means to you and if you say to a human being that you give your love to them your affections sometimes you say it not only softly because it's too important to be screamed in intimate situation but you also repeat it not because it was not misunderstood but because the redundancy is the um, uh, eloquence of the discourse that insists on the important notes therefore words I really love you really really love you and I think that um, once you accept that the tonal system carries its itself um, tension and releases secondary or primary dominance repetitivities that establish the landscape in which you blossom the storytelling regardless if it's just pure music or music that is supposed to imitate let's say a mood story or there is no story there is a story a universal untold story of hope sorrow expectation delay um, in a way excitement when in the middle section he goes into repeated 16th notes by six tuplets rather than by four in alternative half alberti intervals So 
soft way, this pulsed repeated chords are um, something of unsettlement, something of warning, something that calls for our attention, emotional attention. Um, something is happening. When he writes his Waldstein, dedicated to Waldstein sonata, he embeds in the accompaniment repeated chords pattern that has the similar repeated chordal element uh, sense, as I said, perhaps I would even find the word of urgency. in his K310 sonata after his mother's death in Paris stresses us instead of with the repeated notes therefore instead of the with the Alberti alternative chordal element of rhythmic motoric drive which he does the conclusive um, punctuation but not in the opening in the middle of uh, the slow movement of the pathetic in question today. It introduces therefore a rhythmic acceleration. We go from four sixteenth notes of pacing to a more stressful. He didn't do it eight compared to four. It's not... So for eighth note you have two sixteenth notes in the paste accompaniment. And here you have three in minor. Secondary voice again, the polyphony of the keyboard layered playing is to follow the melody. The interruption of the cello or secondary bass voice. Secondary voice, interrupting it with a different character, almost uh, ironic, erratically, and the repeated notes, which I regret, but can't be played above the repetitivity. Da, 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 da. They have to be played inside before they lift fully. for instance, and then the swing cello, any instrument that has not that sharp sound, even if it has staccato in the triplets, compared to the legato, and then the first interruption in the escaped high D flat is also a triton in the melodic line, so it indicates a sense of anguish compared to we had to wait only to hear the end to find a melodic triton, but soothing because conclusive in here, open up and interrupted and unresolved in minor. And you imagine if he had done or he does in fact the 
G of the dominant um, leading tone, but melodically escapes, rising to the um, tritone. And it's like an open question, isn't it? And then, this perhaps ironic comment of the different character left hand notes. Dropping, perhaps, operatic laughter. <laughs> oh, <please. laughs> it's almost as if you have two subtly opposite characters, and inside the harmony in repeated notes, but um, legato pulsed. One can best learn how to play it at its perhaps closest to the whatever we discovered to think it's the truth is to always play alternatively in practicing what it is not or what could have been because of examples of similar situations through the same composer's output or another's and therefore if you do It's a different piece. So it takes so little but so much of this detailed manipulative psychology for listeners so what it means is that when you play it as a pianist since you have only one brain and ten fingers and at least three characters between the subdued accompaniment the eloquent interrupted in its leap up melody and sort of sarcastic comment. Let's admit or adopt that posture, even if some people can argue that is not what it's meant to be musically. But my temporary truth. How do I come to think of it when I play in real time the piece in terms of organizing my only brain into three independently Coexisting characters through my own playing. So it's nothing to do also here in this case for about aesthetic choices, tempo, sound, reverberation, pedal. Of course, that's the colorization of, uh, or the characterization. But just to be able to follow them, unfortunately, most pianists verticalize their hearing because it's the thing that comes first to mind is how do I organize the two hands together? So therefore, how do they fall together? So what happens is that, in fact, the ear hears a combination of the two voices rather than two tracks at the same time. And this... piano is an instrument of short decay, we always hear mostly right away the ones who speak more in shorter values than those who hold longer values because they decay. So we hear a combination of the melody with the accompaniment and secondary voice. So in fact we hear one amalgamated voice, some kind of a marzipan of music. Because it's the only thing we can follow one after the other or combine the follow-up of the two or the three when one of them or two of them don't speak. So the other one speaking, we follow the attention. So we are totally not distracted but unable to follow while following the other one. Of course, listening to instrumental diversity of timbres as an orchestra is with say, say oboe, cello and horns you will hear three different touches it's like having bread, butter and jam in your mouth at the same time your taste buds end up by um, um, blending these tastes into something that you would not know what it is but it is that combination sort of a sandwich of tastes of your taste buds and then after your taste buds did that and you tasted it well it digests so inevitably it arrives in the stomach together at least for most of the elements so you could say that the listener and the performer um, 
should rise in order to live intensely the beauty of the elements to the listening quality of the composer him or herself in order to be able to taste these beauties that are offered to us and not reduce them to what we can follow because of our vertical hearing of how the two hands fit rather than how the two hands can display three elements in various combinations of sharing the material of the texture. So very often you have teachers who colorize to show, you know, red for the melody or yellow fluo or, you know, whatever color, um, so that you can sort of Imagine, imagine following them, but not only when you can, but also through. Sometimes it gets more complicated when they all move in different directions, like in a fugue. I purposely didn't choose a fugue as an example for polyphonic playing, hearing, rendering, because I think it should be also applied to the so-called vertical music chordal, for instance, Beethoven's sonata in C major couldn't be more string quartetish where the four sounds are the same or one ten equally important or one oh one four parts and um, here you have at least a determined melody a determined accompaniment which shouldn't cancel the melody because of its repetitivity Tones. And, the, and then the accompaniment, like a baritone opera, <laughs> I don't agree, but I would like to play <laughs> Of course, that is again reductive. It is not as reductive as to hear. colorization, pedaling, uh, lifting eyes and sometimes acting that I really follow my voices but in real time in fact to control the very cognitive fact of playing all these because I have to play them myself I don't have a separate oboist, a separate horn player, a separate cellist we have to conglomerate together. Here I have to subdivide the attention while connecting um, the following, uh, follow up rather, of all the tracks, which are meant to crunch blend together if you take a slice of the pie and you have a harmony. But it's not because of the harmony, it's because the melodic voicing and elements contribute to create in a frozen flash, a vertical um, slice that perhaps you take in your mouth and you taste it. Let's say hot apple pie with a cold ice cream, uh, vanilla, and at the same time you put it in your mouth. It reminds me, speaking of these tasting analogies, that one day I was uh, teaching one of my studio classes in public and I um, brought um, cherry tomatoes to the students who were listening to another student of the studio play a Beethoven sonata that has always, as most of Beethoven sonatas do in his expression, in sforzando, like some kind of a pulse accent that means something more than melodically or more than altern an alteration, it's just like something striking. And I told them, why don't you then listen to it in a sensorial way, not only through your ears, but also through your taste buds, and then crunch the um, um, cherry tomato, which previously you would keep in your mouth at the moment of esforzando, and feel it implode inside you. It's not very serious, or very silly. And often comparisons to tastes are to do with humans, because that's our senses. There are some senses we don't develop enough or don't develop at all, and some that talk to our imagination. And uh, I find that musicians often talk of food 
when they try to describe what they want to convey, to organize in chamber group or in orchestra conducting or in solo playing or practicing, recording session, teaching, explaining. Anytime you have to put words on what is untellable since the music by itself doesn't need the words because it is its own words. It's like privileging a translation to the original text just because you don't speak the original text but if you really cherish the original text and you read it in the original text until you become a scholar in that language of music which is not as universal as um, the common saying goes about because in order to be universal it has to be very personal and then very um, identified to a given time period so that uh, non-classical music lovers might think that classical music is something between, let's say, Monteverdi and Ravel, because it's sort of like serious music. It's not entertaining per se, even if there are entertaining factors in it, compared to pop entertaining music, which is there mostly, like Satie used to speak of his own music picking of the beginning of 20th century in a humorous way, music for uh, background, like um, furniture music. But it can be intelligent music as well as um, bad music or um, I think in any case classical music as we call it is impossible to frame because it it takes such span of humanity's development between novel tradition, notation, intellectual fugue like writing compared to a aria melodic singing imitation and the piano as an instrument allows to sort of browse through most of these because no matter how well you hear it in your, uh, let's say, horizontal, layered, polyphonic ear, you cannot play a fugue by Bach on the oboe because um, it's only one uh, sound at a time at best, sometimes two, but in awkward situations. But it doesn't mean that you don't hear it. Or Bach played on the solo violin sonatas with the fugues. <laughs> suggesting it, voicing it, delaying it, yes, you can. Rhetorically, you can express it. It's almost like saying like black and white compared to 3D color film. It has its own um, meaning. Even if um, you could say it's more realistic, it's more breathtaking, or it's more daydreaming, or it's more poetic, and it's using more shadows and lights rather than blunt colors, or perhaps subtle colors, or perhaps then which type of lighting for these colors compared to the black and white or how did actors speak in the first uh, films of the speaking films compared to the silent films where they didn't have to express most of the meanings through their face but have to say it through the word and all of a sudden it becomes more intellectual acting rather than just uh, commedia dell'arte acting through the face and how things adapt people adapt um, or adopt perhaps both, to the various um, means of expression situations and the transporting music from an instrument that is subtly based on articulations like the harpsichord for the keyboard to a piano forte or forte piano which is based on hit hammers that create a capacity for the pianist to really express dynamic roller coaster contrasts. Do they mean more, less, better, differently, even if they perhaps overstate the texture of the music written for the harpsichord? Difficult to know. Who's to blame and who's to know? I think um, we sort of extract the psychological, emotional, intellectual, and sometimes combined meaning of it, if we are moved by a Bach fugue or by a Chopin waltz at perhaps different levels, or perhaps at the same levels, but accepting it differently in terms of our hearing and our rendering and our emotional connection to it and our emotional or intellectual connection to the audience, organizing the form, expressing the meaning, delaying some notes or um, longing for some notes. All these things are mostly embedded in the composer's notation. And most of the 21st century, now that we are into it, uh, performers 
through the plethora of editions and recordings and available interpretations as oeuvre of their own on top of the oeuvre itself, we end up sometimes by being afraid of expressing what it means to us, either by fearing of being wrong, either because we are told so. But ultimately we end up by uh, sometimes out of wanting to do right, um, sort of uh, syllabically recite uh, texts in which we don't put so much of our own. And if we were to retrieve to the tradition of Busoni Liszt um, and other of these pianists who transformed the piece, literally transformed, compared to a translation which would be more the subtle way to convey the meaning through words that you speak in a language you understand, even if you miss the hinted um, words that create other thought processes while you understand a language where the point of the story uses specific chosen words that would or not, but if you were to, um, would hint a secondary dominant thought of something else that is not conveyed directly, but doesn't need to be explained or expressed fully. Or then you just miss the hint, because you didn't think of it, even if you speak or read the language. <clears throat> so there's... Um, at many levels, uh, there is a filter that we do from what we receive of the dead composers, most of the time dead, um, text, and how we put it alive for the audience, most of it alive. But now with recordings, the performers and the audience don't have to meet. Originally, the composer was the only one who was in charge of dying because, in fact, the notation was to leave some kind of a message in a bottle in the ocean. Whoever will reach it, reach, uh, or, yeah, well, you understand what I mean, will take the bottle and open the message and daydream about this person, even if they don't know anything about or try to imagine. I think it's to do with the infinity of time and the finitude of ours. And therefore, we reach to distances and places in, through music um, which we wouldn't have not gone to, either by our body, either by our imagination, even if we study history. Because in a way, we don't play history when we play classical music. We are in real present verb time of the grammar in the 18th century, or in the 19th century, or in the 17th, 20th century, with, yeah, with all these elements, but we don't think of it, and we shouldn't, I think at least, imagine that it's all about um, reconstitution of some kind of a historic um, landscape. Just be in it. Eternally tonal.
I just let myself wander in my uh, imagination within this landscape. And I went places he didn't. Could have, shouldn't have, obviously shouldn't have because he didn't. And that is the problem with today's reciting of the truth compared to understanding the meaning of why it's there and accepting to play it as it is for what it is and what exactly it is. After having done what I just did, which was wander around in a liberating way, allowing to inhabit even better the very notes that he chose ultimately instead of provocatively trying to just play um, a decorated or altered version of the intensity of his specifically chosen notes. So in a way it's an exercise in freedom in order to understand better why you choose not to be free, but to express it as if it's your own. And I find that this improvisatory um, fantasy, uh, CPE back in his uh, essay about uh, uh, performing or expressive ex performance on keyboard, about, uh, wrote it in German, Fantasieren am Klavier, which means to imagine on the keyboard rather than play as a verb or uh, music making, but fantasizing, which is what I did earlier. Not because uh, I would be, and of course I'm not, nothing but by education of one of the most austere teachers in terms of um, um, expectation of oneself and um, unpardonable to oneself and while well, Mme. Boulanger asked me to be, of course, always remaining um, understanding of the others but not accepting my shortcomings. I don't indulge in this improvisation as a truth at all. But if I allow myself these moments of digression, of daydream, is because I think that they nourish um, the focus even better that I will give to the real notes when I play them as I have to because I do, that are written and that are meant to be played. It's almost like as if you say something while you think something else, or you think a little more than what you're saying, but you're not saying it because you don't think it's appropriate, right? Not the moment. You have to say it is in classical music expression with a certain redundancy. Perhaps you'll repeat it. But um, all these um, um, eloquence um, toolbox um, tools can't replace the expression of the pure inspiration. After all, as I said earlier, probably in likely Beethoven didn't think about all these elements in order to construct this beautiful line. It just came out of him as um, contagiously as fever out of uh, cold. <laughs> Sorry for this analogy, but I think about the fact that one is an analytical performer or teacher or scholar or, um, or performer, recording artist, things about the various elements that construct that statement, would it be in Shakespeare, in Beethoven, or a painting in Rembrandt, it's not the details that justify it, it's the fact that you're stricken by the beauty of the artwork that makes you think about how it's made. It does not mean that because you use the same ingredients you obtain the same meal. I think you cook it every time you start it again. And sometimes the ingredients fit better and sometimes less, but all overall like a painter who has to repaint not every day he's painting. You have to repaint every day your landscape of your storytelling that is his. to get a bit lost in your daydreaming of 
that storytelling with your own words. It's refreshing and focuses on the reality of what he really wanted to say to you or through you, to the piano through the piano, to his time or through his time. So deal with the history and present verb tense. Hmm. Whichever the order of the words in my sentence. Thank you.